1972, James R. Burgess Jr. was elected state's attorney of Champaign County. He was the first, and to date only, African American elected to countywide office in Champaign County. When he graduated from the University of Illinois College of Law, he was the only African American in his class. He later went on to serve as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Illinois. But the law was his second career. He played a critical role in a little-known chapter of U.S. military history as a member of the 761st Tank Battalion, the first African-American armored unit to enter World War II. After that, he worked in military intelligence and retired as a major. His son, Steve Burgess, says that when he was growing up, his father didn't talk much about his war experience. But when Steve began to learn about his father's time in the Army, he started on a journey himself to dig deep into his family's history and to find a way to honor his father's memory and service to the country. We'll get the story of the father and the son as we welcome to Illinois Pioneers, Steve Burgess. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I I'm I'm so intrigued by the story. I hope we can tell it well because it's not just one story. It's several stories uh, all in one. To start, maybe we talk a little bit about your time, about your dad's time as the um, state's attorney here in Champaign County because I expect some people will remember him. And also because at that time you were a teenager and, mm -hmm. you know, what do you know about your dad when you're 13, 15 years old? What did you know about your dad at the time? What could you say? Oh, I, re I remember uh, my dad's uh, running for office, the, uh, the campaign. Um, my dad was an assistant state's attorney here for about three years before he ran for office. Um, I grew up in the era of Perry Mason, so I was kind of interested in, in the legal background. I, I mean, I'd go and see him in trials from time to time. So uh, I thought it was something kind of neat. Yeah, this was, it was interesting because, <coughs> as I sort of said in the introduction, this would, the law was a second career for your dad. I think when he graduated from law school, he was 50. Yes, that's, that's correct. Do you know what interest in it, after having this military career, what interested him in law? My understanding is that uh, sometime during the Korean War, uh, I believe JAG itself didn't exist back then, but you basically, if you got in trouble in the Army or in the service, you went and got a, a buddy or a person to speak on your behalf uh, when you're going through like court martial proceedings. Uh, there was a, I don't know the person's name, I don't know anything about what the case was, but there was a white officer uh, that served around my dad that came to him and asked him to uh, represent him in a court martial. And my dad was basically trying to tell the guy, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not interested. And I guess the gentleman from what my dad told me had kind of checked up on him and whatnot and said no that a lot of people thought highly of him so he really was pretty adamant that he wanted my dad to do it. Wow so and, it, uh, so this was a court martial yeah. this man's career was at stake mm -hmm. and he asked your dad who had had no legal training, legal training at all yeah. to represent him. Yeah. And my understanding is that my dad did represent the guy and uh, you know, I don't want to use the term got him off, but the guy was found not guilty of his charges, and uh, that's what sparked interest in my dad of, you know, well, you know, I want to do something when I retire, so that's what got his interest in, in law. Yeah, and, and as I say, I guess, I guess I just want to underline the point. When he graduated from law school, this was 1965, mm -hmm. he was the only, only black person in, in, in his, his class. class. Yeah. Did he talk much about what his law school experience was like? I know he struggled. Um, his first semester just making the adjustment. Um, you know, I don't have any idea what, I've seen pictures of his graduating class, uh, although back in the 60s everybody had crew cuts, but I'm gonna assume the, the age was, you know, in mid-20s on average. Um, so he would've I, been I know, a lot older than, yeah. than the other people. And I, I can remember as a, as a kid, because I would've been, uh, about seven years old when he graduated that uh, I can remember times that, you know, I'd go with him to the law library at night and he'd be reading and reading and reading in the stacks and uh, I know he spent more time there than he, than he spent at home. Yeah. Well, <coughs> the, a big part of the story has to do with your dad's service in, in the war. A as part of this, this uh, black tank unit, the Black Panthers is mm -hmm. what they were called. They fought in Europe, they fought under the command of George Patton, fought very armor honorably highly decorated it's it's a great it's a great story but it's not a story that's really very well known people 
maybe know something about the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. They've heard about black fighter pilots. Right. But these black tankers, we have, why have we not we heard about them? I think the biggest thing is that a, a lot of people uh, are certainly familiar with the Tuskegee Airmen, um, and that in history books has probably been written more so about. Um, my dad never talked when I was growing up whatsoever about them. Um, I first became aware of them uh, in the mid-90s, and I was really shocked. I do know that PBS had done a, a uh, piece on them in the early 90s, mm. and there was a companion book that was written about that that my dad purchased, but uh, you know that kind of went on the shelf with a lot of other books. Um, I didn't really totally become aware of the whole story and background until about six or seven years ago. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Lakers legend, wrote a book uh, called Brothers in Arms that, uh, that talks about the whole 761st. And I, I was never aware that uh, until reading my dad's book um, that was published during the war or shortly thereafter that Jackie Robinson, the baseball player, was in my dad's unit. Here's, uh, here's uh, just an, another great detail on, on this story, that the men who were training to fight the, the, uh, in the tank corps, the black tank units, were training in the Deep South. Mm -hmm. So they were getting ready to go fight the Nazis, and were dealing on a daily basis with discrimination. And probably the most famous member of the 761st was Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. What happened to Jackie Robinson? Uh, Jackie Robinson was, uh, they started their training uh, in uh, Louisiana, and then later on they went to Camp Hood, which is known as Fort Hood today. Um, there had been a lot of problems within the War Department and on different bases in the South for training of how the, uh, the, the black soldiers were treated, both on and off base. It was the Jim Crow South. Um, Jackie Robinson was riding on a bus on a base uh, at Fort Hood, and this was shortly before my dad's unit you know, was activated to go to Europe. And the uh, bus driver asked, well, didn't ask, but basically told him he needed to go to the rear of the bus, and Jackie refused, and uh, for that he was court-martialed. Um, my dad's uh, commanding officer of his unit uh, was a white gentleman named uh, Colonel Paul Bates, and Colonel Bates apparently refused to sign the court-martial papers. And uh, all the Army basically, well, the brass basically did was they transferred Jackie to a different unit and got a different officer signed the papers. Yeah. Would, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to come back and talk, talk some more about your dad, and maybe you can talk about some of his experiences. Again, I, and one of the intriguing parts of this story is that, so when you were growing up, you knew that your dad had fought in World War II, maybe knew a couple of details. But it was not until after he had passed and then you started looking into this history that you knew he was in fact part of this very famous, should be famous, tank unit. Mm -hmm. How did you come on that, <laughs> on that detail that you n had never known? I didn't come upon it until actually reading uh this book here that was written by a uh, Negro press reporter who was uh, embedded with my dad's unit during the war. Um, there's a couple pictures in this book about my dad. There's even some text written about some things that he did. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even know that they even embedded reporters with, uh, with units back in World War II, like, uh, like Vietnam. Yeah, so this is, this is a book, that, the title of the book is Come Out Fighting, and that was the, the motto of, of the unit of the unit, of the Black mm -hmm. Panthers. And, and so there, obviously this is a, an old book, well-worn, and uh, it's an account of their experiences. And, and you said um, you, you came across this book and you started looking at it and you realized your father was yeah, in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you go about trying to maybe put together some kind of understanding about what he had been through and, and uh, what this unit had done? Um, well, I started doing more and more research, uh, trying to find, I mean, thank goodness now we have the internet, so things are a lot easier trying to find things. Um, but getting on the internet, I found out that this unit actually has a uh, website. Um, 
they, for a lot of years, apparently they had reunions. Um, I was shocked to find out that, uh, and once again, my dad never talked about this when I was growing up, but my dad, um, in 1977, was appointed by President Carter as a U.S. attorney. Mm -hmm. Well, this particular unit actually received a presidential unit citation in 1977 from President Carter. Um, 30 years after the war for things that they accomplished during the war. And I was like trying to boggle with my mind that uh, I know that members, surviving members of that unit were actually invited to the White House. Yeah. Uh, my dad didn't go. I don't know for a fact if he, I would assume he would have been invited, but you know, he didn't participate in any of those kind of functions at all. Um, I wish now I kind of knew maybe why or why he didn't want any kind of recognition for this, that, or the other, because um, it leaves a lot of unanswered questions. But that was just, you know, my dad was a complicated person. Um, but I guess I would say he went through his whole life really never looking back. He was always looking forward on, on what, what to do next or what to accomplish next. Let's talk specifically w about what it is you're talking about, because the, the reason that we know you and we have met you and we know about your dad is that you embarked on maybe what some people would say was a difficult mission. You decided that there should be some kind of memorial to your dad to acknowledge his service and other people's service. And you thought, well, we got a courthouse, a federal courthouse in Urbana. Maybe that should be the James R. Burgess Jr. Courthouse. And you started out down that road. Why, why that? Um, well, as you know, my dad was a U.S. attorney for five years under President Carter and President Reagan, uh, plus serving 20 years in, in the Army. Mm -hmm. um, when my dad became the U.S. attorney, that courthouse did not exist here, and he actually did not even represent Champaign-Urbana. The old Eastern District, which doesn't exist now, but at that time it ran basically on a line from Danville to uh, East St. Louis and everything south to Kentucky. So it was basically around two-thirds the size of the state. Uh, he had three or four offices within that district. Um, the reason why I picked the federal courthouse in Urbana was just the fact that my dad's legal career, as it were, started across the street, the Champaign County Courthouse. Mm -hmm. um, and because of his government service and his position, I thought, well, kind of bringing it full circle f across the street. That was, that was the connection that I made. Um, and it really had nothing to do with, you know, being in that particular building because yeah. it didn't exist at the time. And plus being a, a local person that for once, you know, maybe we could drive by a building and see a name and some people might know who that is. Other people will be like, well, who is that? Because it's, it's not, one of the uh, the normal names that you might see on a yeah. on a federal building. Well, I'm sure that that some people might you might have gotten reaction from some people saying, "Well, Steve, we think your dad was a fine man, and and it's right and proper that she, we should honor him somehow." But that's he's not the kind of guy that whose name we put on federal courthouses. Matt, that's that's true. I've I've had uh, quite a few people tell me that, and it got to the point that uh, I think the overriding thing that I was told was that my dad lacked stature. And how did that make you feel? And, uh, you know, I, I tried to uh, prepare myself from the very beginning that this was not going to be a easy, it wasn't something that was going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, it's, this whole thing has certainly been a history and a civics lesson for me. Um, but having some people tell me that in a way, it kind of, I don't know, in the beginning it stuck in my craw, so to speak. Um, and then I would go back and talk to people about it again and basically ask them specifically, what do you really mean by, by that? And they would tell me and, uh, you know, trying to be respectful and everything. I understand to a certain extent what they're saying. I mean, that's just kind of like business as usual and, and there's these, uh, call them unspoken guidelines because I told them, uh, you know, I, in the meantime I had from some help of people here at the university, 
had gotten a hold of the statute that applies to naming courthouses, and that wasn't specifically in there uh, as something to exclude. Mm -hmm. uh, you can name it after a non-citizen if you can get the votes. I mean, name it after E.T. I mean, so. And this is something that, that then the, the, the Congress would have to, someone would have to have a resolution and it would have to be had sponsor, it would have to go through the whole process and eventually the, the Congress would have to vote. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Well, this is, I, I, you know, I know for you this, is, this has been a long journey and it's not over yet, but it, in a way to make kind of a long story short, there was some interest and some sympathy, I think, in the, our congressional delegation, uh, in our, our guys in, in Washington. And it looks like there will, in fact, be a building named for your dad, not, not the courthouse, but there will be a building. Yes, um, in the beginning of, uh, I should say the beginning, in uh, April of this year, uh, Senator Durbin, Senator Kirk, and Congressman Davis, and then the rest of the Illinois Congressional Delegation um, co-sponsored two separate bills, one in the Senate, one in the House, to rename the uh, U.S. Post Office here in town, or Champaign, on campus at 3rd and Green after my dad. Um, after three years, I can tell you that the day that I found out that the bills were introduced was a big weight off my shoulders because I'd waited three years just to get to that point that somebody finally made a decision that we're going forward mm -hmm. or, or something's going to happen. Um, and then uh, over this summer, uh, the end of July and August, the, uh, the U.S. Senate actually has voted on, on their portion of the bill now. They're identical bills. They're worded the same. Um, so it has now passed the Senate. Um, I'm now waiting on the U.S. House, and uh, my understanding is that um, I'm beholden to one guy who is uh, Chairman Daryl Issa from California, and whether or not he's going to allow a vote on the bill. It's stuck in his committee. Um, so that's where I'm that's at. Where I may, I may get there. a vote, I may, I may not. It's all up to him. Yeah. So. Two now, as we've sort of laid some groundwork there, I, I want to maybe come back a, a little bit and see if you can talk a little bit more about what you learned about your dad's wartime experience. He didn't tell stories, but you did find some stories about mm -hmm. him and what he, some of the things he had actually done. Tell us something about a, a real war story that involved your dad. Well, I was... Uh I became aware from reading the book, for one, that uh, my dad's... Uh he was a company commander of uh, Company C of the 761st, and they were one of the first uh, armored units to meet up with the Russians in Germany. Um, shortly before that happened, my dad's unit had crossed a bridge, apparently, and uh, they discovered there was, I believe it was a Sherman tank, but there was a tank off, off the bridge in, in the water. And my dad, uh, <laughs> my dad, uh, jumped from the bridge fully clothed into the water to hook up a steel, steel cable to basically tow the tank out. And I was like, I was just like amazed because my dad never swam his whole life. My dad was not a swimmer. <laughs> so how he just got that courage or whatever to just do that, um, I was really, really amazed. So um, he was, he came along, here was a, this, this tank in, in the river, and he's thinking, well, there may be guys inside yeah. the tank. We got to get it out of there. Mm -hmm. And with, a, uh, sounds like without really thinking very much yeah, about it, just, he just dove right in. Yeah. Do I have it right that your grandfather, this would have been James Sr., served in World War I? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know what his experiences were? No, I do not. I just found that out recently. And, uh, an even bigger shock, I found out my, uh, I found out that my great-great-grandfather, his name was James Burton, um, actually served in the Civil War as a Confederate soldier. That was, <laughs> that This was is a, a part of the shock. story we have to talk about because uh, <laughs> this is something that I'm sure that unless people have studied Civil War history, they, they might not know. And I guess there's still, among historians, there are questions about 
how many Southern blacks mm -hmm. actually served, what they did, were there actually former slaves, or oh, well, I would have been former slaves, slaves that were in mm -hmm. combat. Nobody exactly knows. But you're, and you're trying to learn more about your history. You did come across this yeah. detail that, in fact, this was, yeah, I've, this I've, was your great, great, right. two greats, great, great grandfather, yeah. who had been born a slave. Right. And was still, was still a slave. And at that time was still a slave. Yeah. You don't you know anything about what his experience was, uh, other than the fact that you have a piece of paper that's, that says that he... I've got a couple of different pieces of paper. Um, one is like his original muster roll. I do know that uh, shortly thereafter he was actually transferred to an artillery unit. Um, this would have been in the state of Tennessee. Um, it's written in cursive, so I, I do know like his height um, and whatnot um, and his age. Uh, some of the stuff at the bottom I haven't really been able to of course, I'm looking at something that I've found online, so not being able to look at the original document to kind of make out what is that cursive writing, what are they really saying, but, um, yeah. yeah. And, and, oh, and, and this, the kinds of things that you've, you've learned about your family, and you're continuing to, to learn more about your family, going back several generations, mm -hmm. that was really all after the the initial discovery yeah. about your dad being in the in the Black Panthers that that is the the tank uh, unit Black Panthers the 761st and about his his war experience that was all after that right right yeah. yeah I've been I've since I first started this I've been trying to basically fill in the blanks as far back as I can go to get a better understanding of the true history of where my dad came from mm -hmm. um, what what he learned or what you know, basically what, how he grew up, um, what he picked up and, you know, carried forward yeah. um, to me and, you know, the next generation. And I think by, certainly right now, I've, I've acquired over the last several years, and especially a lot this year, um, a lot of puzzle pieces, as it were. Um, sometimes I'll get, you know, five or eight, and I don't really know how they fit in, but I know that they're my pieces. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I'll find like one thing and all of a sudden you know, all these others will all make sense. And so I'm basically trying to fill in a, fill in a picture. Yeah. Your dad grew up in the Jim Crow South before mm -hmm. World War II. Did he talk much about what life was like when he was growing up? Um, well, yeah, it was, it was hard. Uh, I think the biggest thing he always took from that whole experience throughout his whole life was um, society as a whole may give you setbacks for all sorts of reasons, good or bad, indifferent. Um, but you have to make up your mind what you want to accomplish and, you know, work towards your goal. It may take you longer than the next average person, um, but that's just the way the cards kind of got dealt at the time. It, it wouldn't have been surprising that having had a kind of hard scrabbled childhood and worked really hard for everything that he had and had these two really remarkable careers, military career and then a career in law. Uh, y you would, uh, you could forgive him for, for giving lectures about, you know, when I was a kid or, you know, or talking about having been through really tough times, mm -hmm. but he didn't apparently. Wow. He, he didn't, uh, he, he didn't engage in that that kind of thing at all. No, I, I don't think that was ever really in his thinking whatsoever, which I think is really, to me, look, to me today looking backward, I really find that as being pretty remarkable. And I don't, I don't really think, uh, you know, I'll be the first one to admit my bias because it is my dad. But at the same time, I kind of think that really it wasn't just my dad that was like that. It's, there's a whole generation of people um, that that's the way they were back in those days and, mm -hmm. and how they moved on and, and became successful and, you know, like the post-war boom, as it were. This, this story, <clears throat> this, this big story, the things that you've learned about your family, this is in, in one sense, this is really personal because it's your family. Do you feel so that in some way, though, that this is, when you look at this long story of perseverance across many generations, starting with people who were not free, is, is something of an American 
story? Uh, I'd say certainly. Um, I think it's an American story that I think a lot of people just don't even realize uh, because it hasn't really been exposed or it's not talked about or I think there's like a personally I think there's a lot of lessons in in not only my dad's story but the story of where we were as a country mm -hmm. back then and where we are now um, depending on how things are perhaps uh, maybe we're not as far ahead as what we think but we certainly I would hope that we don't necessarily want to go backwards um, but there's still a lot of people I think today for all sorts of reasons that that struggle and uh, I think you know our country today is probably a lot better today than perhaps what it used to be but um, you know this is just one example of you know <laughs> Talk about struggle and hardship. I mean, just kind of put your uh, put your nose to the grindstone, as it were, and just keep working mm -hmm. because, you know, it's it's kind of like the old that saying of you know the sky's the limit. We're just about at the point where we have to to finish. I, I guess maybe as one kind of last thing. I, you know, we talked maybe way at the beginning about how you know, particularly when you're a kid, what do you know really know about your father? And maybe if we're lucky. We get to know them as we get older. Do you feel that having done this, that it's brought you closer to him? Oh yeah, certainly. Um, when I was growing up, you know, I wasn't the closest with my dad, and he was. Uh, I mean, from certainly, I guess, the military back on, he was really stern and disciplined and, and whatnot. So I mean, I totally get where all that came from now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I certainly I wanted to honor my dad. Um, and no matter whether I get a vote in the House or I don't, I know that I really did give it my best shot. Um, I know that his story is is being told in in ways that I never really imagined. I mean, this story, uh, maybe you're not even aware, but I actually do know that it's gone nationwide since this whole th thing started. and. Uh, and that still continues to build, so. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place for us to stop. It is a good story, and I thank you very much for coming and spending some time and, and talking with us. We appreciate well, thank it. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And to all of you who are watching, thank you very much. Glad that you could be with us. Hope that you will tune in again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers. <laughs>